do you want to check mic first or you want to go ahead and do that? Uh, you can check it out. Hello? Hello? It sound okay? Okay. started as I'm sure a few people will, will continue to follow in for, for the next couple minutes. Uh, today I, I want to give a very warm uh, introduction and welcome to Dr. Pragnesh Patel. Uh, he is a fifth year resident of the uh, Internal Medicine Psychiatry Combined Program uh, and he's going to talk with us today, today about uh, intranasal naloxone. Uh, Dr. Patel is a uh, graduate of Gudraj uh, Medical Gudraj State University, uh, where he received his medical training, and he has been in uh, here in Johnson City as part of the program for the past five years. Uh, he will be graduating uh, and become board eligible at the end of June this year. Um, so thank you so much for speaking with us today, and I will go ahead and let him get started. Thanks, Jeremiah. Is sound okay for everyone? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, well, let me tell you first why apologize for a last minute change in the topic because uh, I found something really interesting and I want to talk to you about. Uh, thanks to Dr. Hansen, uh, especially for his help. This thing, uh, I don't think uh, many of us know about this intranasal naloxone. It's, uh, very, it's not new for medical community, but I think it's new for our institution or maybe new for uh, uh, especially intranasal route. We've been using uh, intravenous, intramuscular things for a long time. That's the only thing for opioid uh, overdose. But intranasal, it's one of the new things, just still uh, coming out uh, for many uh, opioid overdose case. So let's get started. Okay. Oops. Okay. So standard disclosure statement have nothing, no financial, nothing. So these are the some objectives I wanted to uh, talk to you guys. Uh, I know it's a basic thing to learn and recognize overdose, but sometimes people miss that pretty often. So I think it's a good review. We'll talk about that. Uh, the important thing, how to use intranasal naloxone. It sounds pretty technical, but doesn't require too much training. So we'll discuss that in the next few, few slides. You identify possible responses. How does it, uh, what does it do to patients, especially come with overdose and what's their uh, response to that? When we need, especially, uh, we'll, we'll talk in a few slides, uh, let a lot of uh, non-medical people, they're using this. So we should be, as a medical personnel, we should be able to use that without any uh, issue. And uh, We'll, we'll have, we'll know some basic uh, opioid uh, overdose measures, so. so. I just wanted to begin the presentation with, uh, wanna know, wanna tell you how big the opioid uh, uh, in this country is. Uh, again, we have opioid prescription and then there's a non-prescription things. So if you look at this on the left, uh, graph, it says uh, over the solid black line is uh, prescription opiates and light gray is uh, heroin, assuming it's non-prescribed and uh, other uh, over-the-counter street drugs. So you can see uh, the, the uh, association of uh, every year it, the graph is going up, especially if you look at the comparison for prescription drugs, it's tremendously, like it just go all the way up. So you can see it's the prescription drug that's more uh, prob could be problematic than uh, over-the-counter the street drugs. On the right side, you can see in particular uh, state, Massachusetts, they've uh, conducted this study and found uh, this pilot study and they found significant increase in uh, opioid-related death. And again, that's mostly prescription related to. Uh, on the bottom uh, graph, you see this uh, most common reason for drug overdose and death from drugs. And again, you, if you see the first one on the left side, that's the opioids and other drugs. And you can see the opioids 
always or mostly they're associated with other substances. And if you see the uh, other drugs, they're not very common to mix with other drugs. But opiates are always, always uh, number one. Uh, again, this is one of the basic slides I wanted to uh, discuss uh, because we always assume opiates and opiates are same. They're not same. So what are the opiates? They're basically uh, a natural uh, substance coming uh, from the opium uh, uh, plant. They're not made, not artificial, not designed. They're natural thing. And common examples are heroin, codeine, and morphine. They are the opi opiates. Opiates are the one, those are manufactured, synthesized, designed for various medical and non-medical purpose. And you can see the big uh, list of uh, the opiates. No difference in how they act, how they uh, produce their effect on brain and uh, body. Again, we often missed uh, opioid overdose and uh, their side effects. <laughs> We always talk about side effects and risk and benefits, but we often missed uh, uh, in, in maybe in our office, in ER, uh, in your private practice or anywhere. So I think it's important to know what are what could be the commonest prop side effects or maybe an early sign of overdose so we can intervene early. So you can see on the left side, it's the common pretty, uh, side effects, which you all already know. On the right side, it's uh, one of the commonest uh, early sign of uh, opiate overdose. And the big thing would be a uh, patient passed out, unresponsive, uh, no breathing, uh, heart beat slows down, uh, and other, like, they develop cyanosis. What, is, what that means is blue is discoloration of the skin's nails and lips, all the mucosal members. Most commonly, it's lips and uh, 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 the, that's the most common site for, to find out the cyanotic uh, lesion, uh, features. Okay, when we talk about naloxone intranasal, we need to know uh, what naloxone is, what it does, and what's its basically pharmacokinetics and dynamics. We've been using naloxone for almost many years. That's the treatment for opiate overdose, as, we, as I talked about. So basically what it is, is it's a competitive antagonist. That means it, it competes with the other opioids to act on the same receptors, all the opioid receptors. So it's directly one-to-one -one, uh, competition. Uh, I mentioned that I've intravenous and intranasal because most common route for now uh, it's intravenous for opioid overdose. So they've compared and they've done a lot of studies comparing intravenous and intranasal and uh, so most of the reference will be uh, IV and intranasal and what they found is they both could have 100% of bioavailability. So that's a good uh, promising sign. Again with intranasal you can have your peak level within three to five minutes. Uh, and uh, the half-life is pretty much uh, almost the same. So those are some of the promising uh, features and signs uh, that we can definitely use intranasal uh, equal, like just like the intravenous when we have to. These are some uh, graphical uh, presentations showing uh, the uh, peak level uh, of uh, several various routes, like on the left A, it's intravenous, uh, B, it's intranasal, uh, intramuscular, and the on the bottom, C, it's uh, intranasal. As you can see, uh, uh, they've used different uh, dose for different routes, and they've tried to calculate and uh, measure the serum level of the naloxone at different time. And basically, what they found is uh, just one second. What they found is. Uh, the bioavailability of uh, intranasal was 4% of IV, and for IM was 35%. Basically, uh, uh, they could have, they, they have 100% of bioavailability, and uh, the peak level rises within three to five minutes for intranasal. The FDA, uh, we always, have to bond with FDA rules and regulation. Unfortunately, FDA has, doesn't approve intranasal naloxone for uh, opiate overdose use, but it still uh, it has it promotes and encourages people, especially medical community, to use if we have to, not for non-medical 
uh, people. So uh, again, uh, it's but doctors can still use if they feel if it's indicated and they know how to use it. And uh, especially they use a device called Advisor just to increase the release and the uh, availability of the uh, medication. So again, FDA is still working on that. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a uh, on uh, FDA approval list soon. When we uh, use naloxone, we assume it's only opioid, but a lot of time it's not just opioids. They're a combination of things. As I've mentioned in, uh, oh, I have this uh, uh, graph again, just to kind of show you that opioid is, most of the time it's associated with other drugs and uh, substance. It's not just opioid. So it's important if naloxone doesn't work, doesn't mean it's not effective. It could be some other uh, drugs mixed with uh, opioid. So we need to keep that thing in mind too. Why uh, we use intranasal? We have IV, intramuscular, all this uh, for many years. Why do we need to use intranasal now? It has been working, like IV is working, intramuscular is working. Why do we need intranasal now? So these are some uh, possible uh, benefits uh, of intranasal use. The, the big thing in this country is uh, opioid uh, overdose people, they have a lot of uh, like delirium, and agitation and they fight with EMS people a lot and there has been a big study like there are several studies which shows that increased risk of needle injuries with EMS people especially when they handle opioid and other uh, uh, overdose patient so for them it's a, a big uh, for them it's a big uh, benefit they could avoid all this needle stick injury and avoid any blood bone infection second is it's easy to use it it doesn't require too much training it's very simple if you see it we'll, we'll, uh, uh, discuss in the next few slides, but that's easy to use. Anybody can use it. Uh, doesn't require uh, full training. Anybody, fem uh, family member, layperson, even law people can use that. And they have been using several states. Even a uh, few states have approved the law people. They use uh, their intranasal. Again, as effective as other uh, route, less severe withdrawal symptoms. That is one of the other uh, main uh, reason that when patients come out of uh, opiate overdose, it doesn't. <laughs> they don't feel like uh, typical, they feel they will be feeling like withdrawal phase. So less withdrawal symptoms compared to intravenous and other routes. And again, that's 100% uh, bioavailability. <coughs> so uh, again, it has some pros and cons too uh, when it comes to intranasal route. Uh, first line for EMS people because it's easy to use and uh, doesn't require intravenous intervention. Uh, based on some studies, it says that it's slow to act but uh, produces less withdrawal than compared to others uh, route. Acceptable to non-users, uh, no needle stick and uh, no disposal concerns. On other side, if we talk about uh, some uh, cones, no FDA approval yet. We're still waiting on FDA approval. Again, we don't have any large studies in this country. Still, there are a few studies going on but we don't have any final outcome yet. So we'll know more when it, uh, they complete. Uh, Assembly requires subject to break it. It does require some assemble, assembling process, but again, it's not a big thing. Uh, cost, $30 per kit. If you look at how many, how much money they get spent on opioid, $30 is nothing for this life-saving thing. So again, that could be a, a problem for a few people. Uh, insurance companies are not still uh, uh, approving or not participating in any of suppliers, so that could be a, a problem for uh, few people and for now we don't have enough uh, supplier uh, national uh, supply so that could be another uh, issue continuing the same uh, why intranasal as I've said uh, it's easy okay just one second Okay, now this is the big topic. Why? Who's at the high risk? Or do everyone needs it, this kit, or there are a few people who fall into this category and uh, needs to be uh, specially looked at? So, individuals who use their uh, medical visits from like doctor shoppings or shop, I mean, they go to different doctors to get different uh, prescriptions, especially for controlled substance. Um, we need to uh, watch those guys. Uh, they use their family members' prescription. How many times we heard, 
I just took one Xanax for my mom's prescription or so and so. So those are some we need to look on that too. Uh, people who had developed some higher tolerance over the period of time and they use higher amount of drugs to just get the same uh, effect. So those are the uh, people we need to look. Former users who recently released from prison or jail and still coming out or coming to drug programs. Elderly people, especially the VA, people are on opiates for pain and some other reasons. Those are the high risk population. Uh, patient using pain patches incorrectly. Uh, children, uh, uh, those are also one of the, uh, we don't uh, discuss, focus on that population, but children could be uh, extremely high risk for opiate overdose, especially when they're using, uh, they don't know, they, the parents usually change the bottle or something, they use it just a drink and they just drink it or take it, it could be really dangerous. Sorry, I'm going back. Tolerance, I have told, uh, said uh, tolerance could be a uh, risk factor. The people use more amount of drugs. Mixing opiates with other drugs. Uh, overdose risk and chronic medical condition. <laughs> Mode of administration of substance. Previous history of uh, overdose. Uh, and I think the last two is not uh, that common, but I just use it for, it could happen. So this is just the chart. Uh, just uh, if you want to keep it uh, in your file folder at the clinic, uh, you can just use it and make sure uh, you check that box if you have to. Now, uh, let's talk about the uh, few studies uh, which already uh, has been done. Again, we don't have any big studies in the United States, but this is uh, one of the big studies they've done uh, over in Australia. Uh, Assuming the Australia has a, too much problem with opioid overdose. So there was a randomized trial uh, just to determine effectiveness of intranasal versus intramuscular, especially pre-hospital uh, treatment center. <clears throat> they've used, uh, they had 155 patients and they've given few patients intravenous and intramuscular and intranasal. And uh, they pretty much used the same dose, two milligram intramuscular and two milligram intranasal. Uh, there were a few subjects uh, drop out and they uh, they left the uh, treatment. But final sample was 155 patient. You can see 71, they use intramuscular and uh, 84 were intranasal. And uh, what was the main outcome of that uh, study was, uh, if you see this on the upper graph, it's basically showing uh, time to return spontaneous respiration, eight per minute, after a couple minutes. And the, the bottom graph is, it just says, time of Glasgow coma scale. This is the GCS scale at the uh, 10 or 11 minute, just to compare the numbers. And uh, what the uh, outcome was, uh, response time to regain respiratory rate greater than 10 minutes per minute. That was their uh, 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 outcome measures. And the secondary measures was the GCS scale. Uh, the results was the intramuscular group had more rapid response than intranasal group. And were more likely to have more than 10 spontaneous respiration per minute within eight minutes. There was no statistically significant difference between intramuscular or intranasal groups for needing a rescue uh, naloxone. And there were no major adverse events for patient needing with intranasal, this was sufficient to reverse opioid uh, toxicity in more than 74%. So uh, you see this intramuscular, these uh, findings were mean time, the spontaneous aspiration for intramuscular, six minutes, for intranasal, eight minutes. Not a big difference. Uh, and again, for GCS scale, there again, uh, no big difference. So the conclusion was even though the IM could be more effective than intranasal, but there was no difference in effectiveness. So it just may be a matter of, uh, uh, timing uh, to produce a desired effect. The, another study uh, using a nasal route for detection of opioid dependence, there was in general psychiatric research uh, and their clinical outcome measure was to detect the use CRS, clinical rating skills, for example, nausea, vomiting, as a part of their withdrawal symptoms. Uh, 
they used uh, this uh, ratings as different time interval, like zero to 30 minutes, and check their vital signs at different intervals. And there was a rating uh, graph scale. They couldn't, they said, uh, they, what they found was no significant difference in vital signs at both route. And this was the pupil size. You can see uh, before and after. And for non-user, it's no big response, but for user, it's significant pupillary uh, dilatation. So was the uh, primary outcome was, uh, there was another study uh, in 2005, uh, medicine abstract, especially for the emergency medicine, and uh, they've used, they had 154 patients, a uh, few of them received IV, uh, and few of them received IN, and the response time was for IV 8.1 minutes, and another was 12.9 minutes for intranasal, and the response uh, time was for e intravenous 20.3 minutes, and IN for 20.7 minutes, and the, all the ones. So basically, uh, this was the, uh, uh, again, there is no significant difference between uh, uh, time to respond to both route. Pretty minimal uh, difference. There was another uh, study uh, in 2005 pre-hospital study, uh, especially using 14-year-olds. I don't know why they've used this particular age group. Uh, so they've uh, overdosed, found uh, alternate status, and the <coughs> outcome measures was number of subjects who responded and time to response. And the, uh, res uh, the response was 95 cases of administration, but 52 responded to either of the route. 43, 43 people did not respond to any of the route. Out of that 43 uh, people that did not res uh, <coughs> respond, 83% responded to intranasal, and 17% uh, respond uh, to IV. They required IV uh, after intranasal. Uh, again, if you look at the time to response, there's in, for intranasal it's 9.9 .9 minutes, for intravenous it's 12.9 minutes. So there's there is some difference in there, but in the previous search, it, there wasn't uh, this significant difference was uh, discovered. Why do we use intranasal uh, with this uh, specific device called atomizer? Because it it's, uh, delivers drugs to a broader mucosal surface, so more chance of absorption and uh, uh, going to uh, circulation and body. <coughs> Again, so these are some basic steps. Uh, how can we use uh, this uh, device? Again, we need to make sure we do, we follow basic uh, concept of opioid or any overdose uh, protocol, rescue breathing, and uh, especially uh, look for <coughs> any blood or any <coughs> mucus in the nasal cavities. We can uh, use this uh, atomizer, uh, especially keeping at uh, the nasal cavity and just uh, push it and uh, you can repeat on the same side. Again, it's pretty simple, doesn't require any too much technical uh, details. And you can repeat the same on the other side too. And if what the question is, what if only one side is available for some reason, you can still use that for uh, full dose. You don't have to split the dose. In. Again, so these are the uh, uh, some guidelines for how much how much uh, do you use it. It's two milligram. They come in two milligram uh, vial. You can use half in each dose. Uh, continue supporting uh, breathing uh, while uh, the medication is still kicking in. And you can also contact poison control if they don't respond to uh, uh, intranasal or intravenous. There may be another cause of uh, overdose. So these are some basic steps and detail. Uh, on the left uh, side, you see this yellow cap and bottom. It's a uh, free, needle-free syringe. The main one is main vial of naloxone. It has two milligram naloxone, and on the right side, the one the device I was talking to you about, it's atomizer. Uh, you basically remove the caps from both sides, and uh, uh, you can see uh, from front and the back. Uh, you remove the red cap from the 
uh, naloxone vial, screw it and open and enter the vial into a uh, syringe and it will become, because once you, uh, it, it becomes difficult to turn when it is uh, stirred enough. So you just put a uh, syringe into the uh, vial and then attached uh, nasal atomizer at the uh, other end. So these are again the, some treatment protocols. Uh, we follow all the basic uh, opioid overdose and other overdose. And uh, the main thing is if no arousal after five, 10 minutes, we need to still continue to follow standard protocol. But again, keep in mind that there could be other cause of opioid. And the goal is what they found uh, the reason for failure was they were expecting quick results. That's not the case with intranasal compared to intravenous. It takes, it takes into three to five minutes. So you have to wait for at least three minutes before you see any response. So the goal is breathing, not the uh, uh, full awake response. Again, it does have some uh, uh, adverse reaction, for example, uh, it can cause some common allergic or irritation, uh, runny nose, sweating, heart rate goes up, shakes, it just basically opioid, what it sounds like a withdrawal from opioid. Uh, again, uh, fear of causing withdrawal should not prevent the use when the person is unresponsive. Some people, they just worry, what if he wakes up and go through bad withdrawal? That should not be the concern here. There could be there will there could be some uh, issues with the this route, especially if patient has a history of recurrent nasal bleeding or uh, trauma. With they may come with a uh, facial nasal trauma with overdose, so that could be a problem with that part. Uh, some nasal septal uh, abnormalities, uh, suspected mixed drug overdose, uh, and there could be other uh, etiology too. Again, we don't focus too much on children because they could be uh, part of this uh, problem. So we need to understand and know we can still use intranasal in children as well. There is no problem using that. But again, we need to understand that those requirements could be different for children compared to adult population. So there are some guidelines uh, uh, for very small children. Uh, I think it's less than two years. We can use uh, each half of the dose on each side uh, of the nostrils. And for uh, infants, uh, I think it's uh, half a milligram per nostril. So again, it's a half the half the dose of total uh, required for adult population. For children, you can use uh, one milligram uh, per nostril. So that's a full dose for uh, adult. There are, uh, I think the VA has started uh, giving, uh, there is, a, it's on the formulary. We can use opioid uh, rescue kit, what they call. If you find the people may qualify the indication, you can actually hand them or write a prescription for opioid rescue kit. Uh, and I have a picture on that. I'll show it to you at the end of the uh, slide. So it could be available for patient, for high risk population, family. Uh, they have a complete instruction for use. Uh, and the cost of the take home naloxone should not be a factor. As I've said for V, I think it's free, but it could be a problem for uh, non-V or private sector. But again, the cost is not a big uh, factor. Uh, there are a few states that have already started using and promoting, uh, uh, and they've promoted layperson use naloxone if they have to, especially family members, relatives, uh, uh, law enforcement people uh, thing. So I think the, one of the biggest is in Massachusetts, uh, the program called NOMAD, No One More Anonymous Death Overdose Prevention Project. And uh, they have actually trained uh, community people and they have found significant drop in opioid uh, overdose related death. So that's uh, a big, big uh, success for a community program. There are a few programs in New York and North Carolina. Uh, we don't have any uh, uh, final uh, or big uh, outcome yet, but people are pretty excited uh, to use that uh, as a primary uh, uh, thing. So we have a lot of uh, uh, positive and uh, uh, encouraging uh, response there. The, another one in Massachusetts, it's, I think it's everyone knows about this, 
OEND, Opioid Overdose Education and Naloxone Distribution. They basically distribute uh, this kit uh, for patient and the family to prevent any uh, overdose. Uh, in New Mexico, the state law has adapted home person or lay person, they administer it. So they can, anybody can use it. If they know how to use it, they can use it. Uh, outside the United States, there are other countries that are using uh, this type of program. Uh, I'll have some uh, countries. Thing. In the USA, I think uh, more than 52,000 people have been trained especially this uh, Massachusetts program thing, and uh, more than 10,000 rescues with naloxone have been reported. So that's a big number. For uh, Canada, after a safer ingestion facility op open in Vancouver, uh, the, f the overdose uh, rate has been dropped to 35%, by 35%. In Russia, uh, one of the NGO uh, had attracted over 900 new drugs using clients, and uh, they have been using this, this, this program as well. In UK, uh, there were 715 take-home prescriptions were uh, distributed and issued to the prisoners at risk population, and uh, uh, so they're also starting using, and they've started to understand it could be a problem, so they're using the two. In India, there was uh, in North, one of the state in Northeast region. Uh, they were able to uh, train and find, and uh, uh, they were able to find the good response to the 95% of the uh, recorded opioid overdose rate. So that's a big number there too. In China, uh, they have been performed more than 800 successful overdose referrals by just this kind of programs. In Thailand, uh, I think a few NGOs uh, have successfully negotiated uh, to promote the use of these kind of programs. Uh, in Vietnam, I think the f uh, they have 43.5% uh, of injecting drug users interviewed and have survived in overdose just by using this type of uh, program. So that's again a big number there too. In other uh, European countries, they have found pretty similar response uh, and uh, uh, to the f community people. So you can see the numbers uh, and they have also started using uh, things. Okay, there is uh, again, there's a concern of what if person who administers naloxone and if it gets sued. So uh, there is a, we all know about Good Samaritan Law, and they say person who received opioid antagonist or naloxone product is free from any civil or any criminal liability for administering it to person who he or she believes is experiencing an opioid related overdose. As long as the person does not act recklessly with gross negligence or intentional misconduct. If medical assistance has not been sought, person shall call emergency service after administering an opioid or antagonist. So that is something uh, we need to keep in mind too. Especially it's good for the uh, non-medical uh, community. Again, we know there are some drawbacks and problems with intranasal, but that could be a potential improvements uh, for this uh, product. Uh, we know they use more concentrated form, like two milligram in one, that's pretty uh, high dose because normally for intravenous we use 0.4 milligram and then go up. So that could be, uh, uh, we, hopefully we could come up with some uh, low dose or low, less concentrated form. Uh, again, uh, some participants report that assembling could be a problem. But as we looked, it's not, uh, but again, it could be a problem for some people so that hopefully we could come up with some simple uh, device which doesn't require too much assembling uh, process. Uh, United States National Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, NIDA, has provided funding for early uh, development of na nasal spray with the intention that will, be, that will become available in the U.S. market in 2000. So, Again, we need a, a FDA approval to promote and encourage more use uh, uh, in the near future. So this this is what it uh, looks like. Uh, this is from the VA, RVA, and it has this good uh, uh, caring uh, thing. Uh, all the 
necessary uh, instructions and in uh, 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 while syringe and everything. So it's pretty simple. Uh, there's this rescue kit also contains auto injector. I didn't want to talk to it about in detail today, but I just wanted to let you know that could there is an other options for like auto injection, just like epi, uh, epi epinephrine injection for anaphylactic reaction. Uh, that's what that was the first product used for uh, designed to use for opiate overdose uh, in emergency rooms and uh, the hospitals, especially the EMS and the emergency rooms, and uh, it is mostly used for. Uh, emergency therapies, as I've said, uh, it could be used and has been used uh, by law person, lay person, I'm sorry. And uh, again, uh, for family, it could be a little uh, problematic because they don't know how to use it. So that could be a problem. But in this little uh, training, it should be uh, okay. There are some uh, community uh, uh, an EMS response uh, by using this uh, intranasal kit. Uh, nearly 73% had personally seen someone die from heroin. So like family member, friends, if you had a training and if you knew how to use that, it could have been uh, prevented. Uh, study, of, uh, study among 99 injecting drug users in Melbourne, Australia found that three quarters, 74% would prefer intranasal to other route. Uh, including intramuscular and intravenous for various reasons. Uh, wider access to affordable and easy to administer intranasal naloxone could help overdose response programs and even save more lives. And we need more research uh, into this thing in this country so we know uh, the long-term uh, outcome. So uh, this is a summary uh, why intranasal is available as an option for bystander or common people. Uh, we know we we, we knew uh, we uh, discuss how an opioid overdose looks like. Uh, why can why we need to or why we can we use intranasal route? Uh, there is a protection uh, legal protection if you use it, and how to prepare and how to administer uh, intranasal. And I think it's a short presentation. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Yes, sir. Did any Uh, so far, there is not a single case found. What would you expect, for example, if you had somebody whose nasal mucosa had been affected by snorting drugs? That could be a problem. How would you do that? Well, you just basically, I mean, uh, examine the patient, and uh, you always examine the nasal cavity before you administer or use intranasal. Just make sure there is no blood, mucus, or any other uh, septal deformities or. Uh, <coughs> A damage from previous drug usage. So then, then would it be correct to say that the data showing modest differences don't take this possibility into account? Possible, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, regarding the intramuscular auto injector, which you said that some people might have trouble using, mm -hmm. um, the one that I have seen demonstrated has a voice. Oh, okay. You activate it. Uh huh. It says very clearly, remove the yellow cap. Okay. Place that end against your thigh. Mm -hmm. Do not move it. Press the button and keep it pressed. Um, really, you have to be seriously impaired. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, it is more effective. Well, that's something really. <laughs> but I would say that the intranasal, the only benefit is it's cheap. Yeah. One other thing, the second slide, the third slide that you showed has text. Saying that it is 100% bioavailable. Mm -hmm. Up to 100%. The third slide shows the graph, which is actually it's, it's only 4% available. Um, that, that difference is, is huge. Mm -hmm. Very little gets in. Mm -hmm. Luckily, 2 milligrams is a large dose. That's where they use more concentrated form. But the brevity of it is a continued problem. Mm -hmm. So people are going to die 10 minutes later instead of... Well, uh, 
the opioid overdose, they don't, dry, they don't die too quickly compared to other benzos and barbiturates. They have some, they go through a series of uh, symptoms. And if you use that medication wisely and effectively, you could prevent a uh, serious catastrophe. Well, I, I'm not, I don't think it shouldn't be used. I'm just saying it's not enough. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. We need more uh, uh, studies and more uh, uh, details regarding dose and the uh, other uh, long-term outcomes. Yes, sir. I wonder how effective this would be with uh, sublingual buprenorphine overdose. I have uh, found something on that, but uh, uh, they basically uh, not many. Uh, I have an answer. Uh huh. That's a huge dose. In other words, you need to be on an IV drip. This yeah. This is going to do nothing. Nothing. Because that's pretty... Uh, 40, 40 milligrams. Mm -hmm. 40 milligrams by IV or... That's by IV. IV. That's a huge dose. That's a big dose. Mm -hmm. So this would be useless. Yeah. Well, one of my concerns with this is that uh, still the best and most effective treatment Mm -hmm. And, you know, in a patient that's completely apneic, that six to eight minute mm -hmm. response time mm -hmm. is a long time. It is. So, you know, if, if I were to be prescribing this to a patient, I would also want to emphasize the fact that it shouldn't be used instead of mouth to mouth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that should not uh, prevent, uh, that should not impair any standard protocol. It should be uh, ongoing. Yeah. Very nice presentation, right now. Thank you. Um, I once had to administer CPR to someone who overdosed on an opioid at this place. Um, so I was just wondering, how would you compare um, <coughs> if someone was actually administering CPR? Is there any chance of this affecting the administrator? They should no. How would you compare its effectiveness? Um, recovery, I think there's already a question. Um, CPR versus the, the combination versus not, not using. The CPR? CPR versus using uh, intranasal versus not using, which I mean, I think that answer is So the question is CPR versus CPR plus intranasal? Is that the question? Is I think uh, it's important that you uh, perform CPR all the time. Yeah, that's that has shown the uh, main, uh, I mean, it's big. You cannot emphasize as much. You have to continue and provide basic life support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just keep on doing that. Because again, it may take up to three to five minutes. So you have to provide some basic support to there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Say that one more time. Did the 100% bioavailability mm -hmm. quantitative number come from the package inserted the kids were For kids, you said? For the kids. No, it's not from, from that. I haven't, uh, you, uh, no, it's all, mostly from all these studies and the uh, data. Nothing from the instruction packet. All right, well, thank you, everyone. and. Merry Christmas to all and have happy holidays. Thank you. See you next year.